cherry, teak, walnut, cedar, oak, pine, elm, mahogany, birch, maple. There are so many varieties of wood used in furniture that it can be daunting for a beginner. And it doesn't help that what you find in its raw form doesn't look anything like it does with a stain or clear coat finish. This is my number one most asked question. How can you tell what wood you're working with? It's not a simple answer and most of it is just experience, but I am going to give you some tips and explain a bit about wood in general. You're definitely going to want to see this. My name is Angie and I refinish furniture. Sometimes I paint and sometimes I don't, but I always do what I can to save old pieces from the trash. Welcome to my workroom. Okay, so this literally is the question I get asked the most across all my social media. I usually mention in the videos or sale listings for my pieces what kind of wood or combination of wood that I'm working with. And there's always several people that ask how I know what type of wood it is. Spoiler alert, it is not always easy to tell, sometimes I can't tell, and even though I'm going to do my best to share what I've learned throughout the years of experience and hundreds of videos and Google searches for reference material, you need to realize that there is no magic formula. The only recipe for success here is looking at what you have and cross-referencing photos, other furniture channels, and Instagram pages, books. The more you run into a certain type of wood, the easier it will be and the faster you'll be able to identify it. We refinishers are often at a disadvantage over woodworkers when it comes to identification because when we first look at a project piece, we don't get to see the actual raw natural grain and color, especially with older pieces that have darkened with age or have years of cloudy and dirty waxes and furniture polishes. Don't use pledge, it's the worst. In the case of wood veneer pieces, we don't even get to see the end grain and even on solid wood pieces, the end grain is usually obscured by stains and finishes. I'm mentioning end grain because that is usually the best way to tell what a certain wood is, but we don't always have that luxury. Not only that, but older pieces have a higher chance of having been refinished at some point, meaning the color of the wood you see might be a stain and not even the natural color, which can also make identifying the pieces difficult. But before we get into the actual species, there's some basic things to know about wood and some terminology you might hear occasionally but don't fully understand. For those who like to paint wood, it's not going to matter that much, but for anyone who wants to do more restorative work or do paint and wood combinations, both of which I do frequently, this is going to be important and it's going to take a little while to get through, so pause this video, grab some snacks, and then come back. I'll wait. Firstly, let's talk a little bit about the composition of wood in the most general sense that relates to furniture specifically. Timber that has been readied for use in furniture is composed of either heartwood or sapwood or a combination of both. So when a tree is growing, it forms a new outermost layer usually annually, and over time this is what forms the growth rings that we all see on a cross section of a log. But there's a transition that occurs. The outermost part of the tree is called the sapwood and is essentially the living part of the tree. The sapwood is responsible for transporting water and nutrients from the ground up to the leaves. All the wood in a tree starts off as sapwood at some point and some trees have a thicker sapwood layer than others. As the tree ages and forms layer after layer of growth, some of the innermost layer transitions into heartwood. Heartwood is a bit of a misnomer though because it's actually of very little importance to the survival of the tree and relates more to its position within the tree. For furniture, heartwood is preferred by many makers and manufacturers for its deeper color. In some cases, older trees have a stronger, harder, more structurally stable heartwood and its sapwood is softer and weaker, but that isn't a rule and it depends on multiple variables. This is a very general and simplistic explanation. For the seasoned woodworker, this rabbit hole goes very deep, but most of us aren't going to be building furniture or doing um, carvings or wood turnings. So just knowing the difference between heartwood and sapwood can make a huge difference um, when it comes to identification and figuring out why the same board can have two very different colors and accept stains differently. Another terminology that's important here is early wood and late wood. When you're looking at a piece of furniture and you see the growth rings, often there's a thinner dark section and a thicker lighter section. Early wood is less dense and more porous than the late wood. The early wood is formed during the more rapid spring growth and late wood occurs usually in later summer, autumn, 
and even over the winter when growth slows. What does this have to do with furniture? It's important because it affects stain absorption. Uneven, blotchy staining is usually because of large variations between the early wood and the late wood. The early wood just soaks up the pigment and the late wood being more dense, almost resisting the stain. If you saw the video where I transformed a pine dresser into an apothecary style piece, you remember me talking about something called grain reversal. And that's when the stain absorbs much more intensely into the softer, more porous early wood, leaving the late wood barely colored. Softwoods like pine are especially prone to this. A wood conditioner works by first filling those pores in the softer areas of the wood, thus letting the stain absorb more evenly on the surface. I hope that I have explained that well enough. Like I said, the rabbit hole goes very deep and the structure of wood is complicated and there's so much that I just skipped over and a lot that I left out entirely, but because this only relates to refinishing furniture, some of the other stuff doesn't really apply or even matter that much. I really need to stress here that this video is not a quick fix and even if you watch it 10 times start to finish, please do, it doesn't mean that you're going to be able to tomorrow go out to the thrift store and identify every piece of furniture in there. This video is meant to be sort of a jumping off point for beginners and a reference guide and something you can come back to as needed. There is no teacher-like experience, and I don't consider myself a teacher, I just sort of try to relate what I know. I guess that is teaching. Uh, there is no easy way out here, and you really have to put in a lot of work to learn. Even after this video, I already know some of you are going to say, well, I still can't tell the difference between whatever. One of the best things that you can do is follow a bunch of actual woodworkers on Instagram. Your feed will be flooded daily with pictures of amazing projects and most of the time those people are going to tell you what kind of wood they're working with so you can get used to seeing the different grain patterns, um, the variety of grain patterns in the same type of wood, as well as different finishes and different colors. Although like I mentioned before, old finishes can sometimes have cloudy grain pattern on furniture so sometimes the only way to tell is to remove the finish and get a better look. Don't rely on what someone on Facebook Marketplace tells you either. I could go online right now and find 10 pieces listed as being one thing, but I can tell from looking at it that it's actually something else. So finally, let's get into some wood. This list is not exhaustive. These are just the ones that are most common around here that I run into. There are hundreds and hundreds of other types of wood that are used in furniture, depending on where you live in the world. These are, like I said, just the most basic. If there's something here that you want to know more about, but I didn't talk about in this one, leave a message down below and maybe I'll do a part two. Also, if you learned something from this video, leave a message down below, tell me what you learned. It really helps me sort of mold my content and feedback is always good. Teak is a wood that I never really cared much for, surprisingly, um, until I started to work with it. Teak originally hails from Southern Asia, but has since been grown in other parts of Asia, as well as Latin America and Africa. Teak's biggest claim to fame is its inherent resistance to rot, moisture damage, and certain insects. It has been widely used in shipbuilding and outdoor furniture, as the natural oils protect the wood from the elements. When used outside, it often eventually turns a sort of silvery brown color instead of its usual warm golden brown. This is a very thin layer of teak on pressed wood, so it's a veneer that has been sanded down to its raw form. So this is what it looks like when it's sanded. Teak also darkens with age, often ending up with a warm, almost glowing medium brown orange color. Sometimes there will be darker streaks. I've seen some that were nearly black. Because teak is extremely expensive, a lot of furniture, especially from that mid-century time period, is actually veneer and often mistaken for solid teak. While premium solid teak furniture does exist, the cost to build such furniture is often prohibitive and many manufacturers combine quality teak veneer on the larger surfaces with solid wood trims, handles, or legs. The grain in teak is usually fairly straight. Teak isn't very often stained, although sometimes you run into it occasionally, but most of the time, if it's in its natural state or original finish, it's that well-known warm brown. When teak is raw and sanded, its color is a golden yellow, a slight olive tint to it, and it has an almost leather-like scent. Don't purposely breathe in the dust though. With teak in particular, because of the natural oils, some traditional finishes won't work as well. Many prefer Danish oil, which is like an oil varnish blend, 
or in my case, I like to use Odie's oil, which is what I'm gonna be using on half of all of the sample boards that I have. I'm technically using the Super Duper Everlasting Oil and I'm applying it with a 1500 grit Merca Merlon pad. All of my sample boards for this video have been sanded to 220 grit. Teak generally doesn't have an overly high luster when it's raw, but it's quite beautiful once it has been oiled or finished. Some lighter mahogany species look a little bit like teak, but once you've seen several pieces of teak that are confirmed to be teak, you'll be able to tell it quite easily. I would give this a two out of five for identification difficulty with one being the easiest to tell and five being the hardest to tell. Most of the time when you find a piece of cherry furniture in North America, it's usually black cherry. It typically has a fairly straight grain pattern, although sometimes you'll see figured cherry, but not that often in fine furniture. Cherry is a hardwood that is very common in kitchen cabinetry, flooring, and fine furniture. The color deepens dramatically with age to a deep reddish brown. Exposure to natural light will speed up this aging process, so be careful with cherry near windows and glass doors, particularly if you have items sitting on your piece. It's not uncommon to see both heartwood, which is usually a light brown to a light pinkish brown when sanded raw, and sapwood, which ranges from a pale yellow to off-white color when sanded raw, in the same piece. Some woodworkers and furniture makers don't like the variation the sapwood provides and stain or tone it to match the heartwood. I personally love the sapwood. Cherry has a fine, closed pour grain, and it can be sanded extremely smooth with a nice luster. It can be notoriously difficult to stain well, often blotching. Using a wood conditioner followed by a gel stain as opposed to a penetrating stain can help with that. You can also simply clear coat cherry, which is my favorite, and let the natural variations take center stage. Cherry can sometimes be difficult to identify because of how the aging process can differ from piece to piece, and the color can range from a deep brown to a deep reddish brown. Many other woods are stained to look like cherry in color, so you need to assess the grain pattern as well, and often the maker's mark, if there is one, can give it away too. I'd give cherry mm, a 3 out of 5 for difficulty identifying, only because of how dark it tends to get. While ash is used a lot in modern furniture building, I personally don't see it that often in pieces I refinish. I mainly see it on mid-century legs and bases of pieces. Although there's a lot of ash furniture out there, that's been my experience. Many times they have a toner or stain on them to make them blend with the rest of the piece. People are often surprised when working on a mid-century walnut dresser and sand the legs to discover it's a totally different wood and color. Some refinishers embrace the difference and finish with a two-tone look, and others will stain the lighter wood and or tone it to match the rest of the wood. It's personal preference. The heartwood is usually a light brown or beige color, and the sapwood slightly lighter. Sometimes it's difficult to differentiate between the two. Ash has a texture that's really similar to oak, although it's a little bit lighter in color, with a straight grain and open pores. It's easy to work with and stains well. It's mainly used for furniture, flooring, cabinetry, and millwork, and even things like axe and hammer handles. It can sometimes resemble oak, especially after sanding, but it's lacking the characteristic rays that oak has, and I'll talk more about that a little bit later. I would rate ash about a 3 out of 5 for identifying just because it is so similar to oak, particularly when it's stained. Even I sometimes get it confused. I grabbed these two pictures off Redbeard Rustic's Instagram page. He's a guy that only lives about an hour from me. He makes amazing furniture and he does a fair bit with ash so I reached out and asked if I could steal these two pictures. Really good guy. If you want to see some beautiful custom made furniture, go check out his Instagram page. I will link it down below. Maple is an interesting hardwood because most of the time people use its sapwood rather than its heartwood. Normally it's the opposite. Maple has a variety of grain patterns from straight to curly, which is sometimes called ribbon, bird's eye maple, which you see fairly often in antiques with veneer, and my personal favorite is quilted, but it's not that common in furniture. It's important to note that terms like curly and ribbon, bird's eye and quilted, these aren't types of maple, they are types of figure that just happen to be in maple. Maple has a fine closed grain and can be sanded really smooth with a nice luster. It's notoriously difficult to stain, but I've had decent results using a wood conditioner and a gel stain. Maple kitchens, guitar bodies, turn bowls, and cutting boards. Maple is used a lot in flooring and is usually what you'll see on a basketball court or bowling alley. 
often in conjunction with a darker wood like walnut, are also common. The sapwood of maple, which is what is usually used, is typically a light, near-white appearance, while what is known as brown maple or heartwood tends to be pale brown. I don't think I've ever worked on a piece of maple furniture that had a lot of heartwood content. There are many species of maple, but they generally fall into two categories, hard maple and soft maple. Hard maple is what we're talking about here. Maple is one of the easier woods to identify. I would give it a 1 out of 5 for difficulty. Poplar is a hardwood that reminds me a bit of a softwood, and it often has a bad and unfair reputation. A lot of furniture framing is made of poplar and then covered with higher quality woods as it's relatively inexpensive. It has a straight, mostly uniform clothes grain, but where it varies greatly is in its coloring. The heartwood is usually a creamy light brown and the sapwood is pale brown to nearly white. But poplar is known for having streaks of green, yes green, and grey throughout, which is a key identifier. I've mainly seen poplar as framing or underneath laminate coatings on drawer faces of pieces from the 60s and 70s. And it's often used as a veneer on the underside and inside of furniture tops and side panels that have a more expensive veneer on the outside. Because of its telltale green and grey streaking, I find poplar pretty easy to identify. I would rate it a 1 out of 5 for difficulty. I cannot lie, walnut is my baby. <laughs> It's my all-time favorite wood to work with. It's, it's such a beautiful chocolatey brown color that can be warm or cool depending on the piece. Most walnut furniture in North America is black walnut. When sanded down, the heartwood of black walnut ranges from a pale brown to a more chocolate color with darker streaks. Sometimes it almost has a bit of a violet or purple tint to it. It has a fairly straight grain on most furniture with the exception being beautiful burled walnut which is most often seen as veneered segments on vintage and antique furniture. The sapwood is usually pale and it can be almost white at times. I find walnut a dream to stain even though I normally choose to simply clear coat if the piece I'm working on is in good enough condition for it. Walnut was very common in mid-century furniture, although most frequently as veneer over some other substrate. It's also very common in flooring and kitchens. I would lose my mind over a walnut kitchen. Walnut is easy to identify once you've done it several times, but it can be tricky for beginners because of the wide variety of finishes and stains used. I've seen mid-century pieces in their original finish ranging from a light almost butternut color to cool almost grayish brown to a warm rich reddish brown all the way up to a deep deep chocolate brown. So you need to practice recognizing the grain first. When walnut is sanded though there's no mistaking what it is but when it's sealed and stained especially several decades ago it can be a bit tricky. I would give walnut three out of five for beginner difficulty only because of the various color finishes you can find walnut in. Cedar is a softwood and it's one of the easiest woods to identify, not only from the look of it but also because of its signature aroma. That said though, there are many varieties of cedar. The one I see most often in furniture, usually trunks, chests, and wardrobes, is aromatic red cedar. Cedar has a stunning contrast between its heartwood and sapwood, the latter being almost white to a pale yellow and the former ranging from reddish brown to an almost violet brown. The reason cedar is used so often in these pieces is due to its incredible resistance to decay and insect damage. It has a pleasant but strong aroma which naturally repels moths that would otherwise eat away at clothing and linens. You can often buy cedar balls as well to toss into your dresser drawers and closets for the same purpose. Red cedar tends to be quite naughty, not naughty, and is usually either left unsealed or simply coated with some sort of finish that doesn't literally seal the wood. Sealing cedar with something like varnish or poly renders its incredible attributes ineffective and useless. I like to use something like hemp oil after refinishing a cedar piece 
so that it nourishes the wood but also allows it to breathe. You can also get cedar wood oil to use which rejuvenates the wood and reestablishes the aroma if you find it's dissipated too much. With its striking colors and knots, cedar is one of the easiest to identify. I would give it a 1 out of 5 for difficulty. Elm is a bit of a late bloomer favorite of mine. Its wild and crazy grain really stands out when it's stained, although it can be difficult to stain if you sand it too finely, which there's a tendency to do because of its open coarse grain. By the time you have it sanded smooth to the touch, it usually won't take the stain as well. I usually stop at 180 to 220 on elm when I'm staining. Elm is a hardwood and there are actually many species of it. I mainly see red elm in furniture around here. It's commonly confused with oak as the open grain pattern can be similar, though it tends to be a little bit more wild and irregular. Its heartwood is a light brown with a slight reddish hue and the sapwood is a softer version of the same. Elm also sometimes has areas that somewhat resemble feathers. I see elm a lot in the early 1900s three and four drawer dressers, often mistaken for oak. I also see it in mid-century furniture, both in solid and veneer form, and sometimes as the legs or lower base of a walnut piece. These two mid-century elm side tables here are mine and they live in our house. If you want to see a really good example of elm grain, check out the video I did where I refinished two mid-century elm pieces using the Odie's Oil products and pigments. That's what I'm using here on this side, I had a little bit left in the jar. The wood grain is just unreal. Once you grasp the difference between elm and oak, you'll never mix them up again. To the beginner eye, they are very similar, but to me, it's like meeting identical twins. They're seemingly impossible to tell apart until you get to know them, and then you wonder how you ever got them mixed up in the first place. I give elm a 4 out of 5 for difficulty identifying for a total beginner, and about a 1 out of 5 for someone who has clearly compared and seen the differences between elm and oak. Speaking of oak, the time has come. Oak is one of the most common furniture woods out there. I actually have three separate things to discuss. Two categories of oak and what the heck tiger oak is. Firstly, there are two main types of oak we deal with in furniture. Red oak and white oak. Both of these technically refer to groups of trees. In other words, there are multiple species of oak that fall into either of those two groups. The more common one found in furniture is white oak, but red oak is there too. Tiger oak is not a species, although many people still think it is. What is referred to as tiger oak is actually quarter-sawn oak, which is a method of cutting the wood on a different plane, which highlights certain characteristics of the wood, as well as giving it extra strength across its fibers. And tiger wood, which is another thing people sometimes call quarter-sawn oak, is actually simply incorrect, as tiger wood is a species unto itself and has nothing at all to do with oak. This is tiger wood. I see people constantly calling quarter-sawn oak tiger wood. It's not. Please refer to it as quarter-sawn oak. Even the nickname tiger oak is confusing for some beginners because they literally think it's a type of tree. Quarter-sawn oak is absolutely beautiful and as a solid piece of lumber is prized for strength. Quarter-sawn oak is still used today but is found in great quantity in antique furniture, especially mission style and arts and crafts. Our 120-year-old grand piano is quarter-sawn white oak and will eventually be the subject of an upcoming video as it has many finish issues and water damage from a leaky window on one side. Quarter sawn wood of any species has less tendency to warp, cup, and twist and holds up better against moisture than flat sawn pieces. The downside is there's much more waste with quarter sawn wood which renders it more expensive. There's a misconception and I hear it all the time that quarter sawn oak is rare it's not so much that it's rare in terms of the world running out of it, but rather it's much more costly to produce so it's harder to find to work with. So what's the difference then between red oak and white oak? Color alone is generally not the preferred method of identification as tones can vary a lot. And as with all species of wood, comparing the end grain is often the best way to distinguish different types. There's a huge difference between the end grain on red oak and white oak. Red oak is extremely porous and has huge pores, the pores on white oak, however, are usually partially or fully clogged with resin and other material. But as previously mentioned, we often don't get to see end grain when we're looking at a completed piece of furniture, or at the very least, it's obscured by stains and top coats. So we need to look more at the grain. Red oak has a straight open grain with a coarse and uneven texture and large pores. 
The ray flecks in red oak are much shorter than white oak, usually under a half an inch long. It's not as common as white oak for furniture building because it has poor resistance to insects and rot, though red oak pieces certainly do exist. It's also found in flooring and cabinetry. White oak is the most common in furniture, again keeping in mind that red and white oak aren't specific trees but rather a grouping of related oak species, and is especially known for its greater ability than red oak to resist rot and water damage, making it much more suitable for boat building and outdoor use. It's more dense and a bit heavier than red oak and thus slightly more expensive. White oak also has a straight coarse open grain, and heartwood is similar in color to red oak but often has a slightly more olive cast as opposed to a reddish cast. The reflex when flat sawn are typically longer than in red oak, usually three quarters of an inch or longer. Overall, oak in general is easy to point out, but it's not that easy to distinguish between red and white species, especially if the piece has been stained or is under layers and layers of finish and old waxes. For that reason, I give this a 3 out of 5 difficulty, not determining if it is oak, but determining what kind of oak. Ah, pine. We either love it or we hate it. I ride the fence. Pine is a dream to cut and sand. It's cheap, it's readily available, but it's the worst, personal opinion, with that amber patina. If you like that look, I'm sorry, I don't mean to offend, I just personally really don't like it. The problem with pine furniture in terms of refinishing is that it's a bleeder, meaning you absolutely need to prime over it before painting, and it doesn't stain well. You can use a wood conditioner, which helps some, but you often still end up with grain reversal, which I mentioned earlier. For that reason, many pine lovers prefer it in its natural state, with a simple coat of varnish or poly, and just let the wood amber over time. Pine is a softwood and usually very prone to compression damages, like dents and dings, with the exception of a couple of pine species. It's also not the strongest wood, and I'm specifically talking about readily available lumber in big box stores, so I wouldn't recommend it for building those fun tapered leg bases that we've all seen and many of us have done. I prefer a hardwood like oak for that. Pine is the easiest of all furniture woods to identify, especially knotty pine. Select pine, also known as clear pine, is a higher grade cut that has no knots. I don't work with pine all that much, but when I do, I like to have fun with it and play on its quirky tendency to take stain in a dramatic way. <laughs> or I try to make it look like old barn wood using different stains and literally adding damage. It's inevitable that it's going to get dented or marked at some point, so I like to just do it anyway. I give pine a 1 out of 5 difficulty rating. Birch is a fairly common, inexpensive hardwood I see used in furniture framing, as well as veneered tops and sides. The heartwood is usually a pale brown and sapwood is often nearly white. It doesn't have much natural luster at all and it's difficult to stain without blotching. I always recommend a wood conditioner when dealing with birch. The grain is fairly straight to slightly wavy and it has a very fine texture. Birch was used quite a bit in the 60s, 70s, and 80s in furniture and cabinetry, and today, while it's still used for those things, it is one of the most common veneers and plywoods available. You also see birch used in guitar bodies, gun stocks, flooring, and it's frequently used in turning. Birch seems like it would be difficult to distinguish from pine if the pine had no knots in it, but you can see here when I put the pine next to it, although the wood grain is similar, the color is just, it's very different. It's more yellow, and the birch just has a smoother and harder feel to it. Overall, birch is fairly easy to recognize. I would give it a 2 out of 5 on the difficulty scale. There are many species of mahogany used in furniture, but I'm going to touch on three that I run into the most. South American, African, and Sapili. Speaking first about mahogany in general, not all species are desired in the same way, and some are higher quality with specific characteristics that set it apart from others. You don't always have to know the exact species. Simply listing your piece as mahogany is often enough, but I'll still mention a couple varieties here. Mahogany is generally easy to work with, it's easy to sand, and my favorite feature is that it has minimal shrinkage and expansion, and it's moisture resistant, which is why you see so many dressers and cabinets made of another type of wood, but they have mahogany drawers. It's not just for the look of it. The joints stay nice and tight, and you don't have that semi-annual expand and contract, can't open or close the drawer problem. 
The pores in mahogany are close together, but are also quite large, giving it a medium to coarse texture. You should be able to see the pores. Mahogany is similar to cherry in that it darkens with age. It has a wonderful natural luster, often displaying chatoyance, which means that the wood cells have grown in different, non-uniform directions and thus light bounces off of them at different angles. Cortison mahogany exhibits interlocking grain that gives the appearance of ribbons or stripes. African mahogany actually consists of a few different species, and while it is technically mahogany, a small handful of purists don't recognize it as such. African mahogany is seen frequently in boat building, furniture, and fine trim. I often see it as plywood veneer for use in drawer bottoms and furniture. Its heartwood color varies, but it's typically a lighter reddish brown to a medium reddish brown, and sometimes has darker streaks. African mahogany is unfortunately listed on the IUCN red list, meaning that its availability is threatened. They consider African mahogany to be a vulnerable species. South American mahogany. This tropical hardwood is still one of the most valued and prized woods. Its heartwood varies from light to dark reddish brown with a straight to wavy grain and medium texture with a decent natural luster. It stains and polishes to an excellent finish, though many choose not to stain it and just clear coat the natural wood. This is mainly used in high-end furniture, fine instruments, boat interiors, and is also a favorite for woodworkers and turners. It's more expensive than African mahogany and is also listed as vulnerable on the IUCN red list and is also trade controlled so as to avoid utilization incompatible with the survival of the species. Sapili so is a gorgeous wood that isn't literally mahogany but is in the mahogany family and shares many characteristics of mahogany. When genuine mahogany became trade controlled, a lot of people turned to Sapili and African mahogany to fill that void. It's sometimes even referred to as Sapili mahogany, somewhat incorrectly. I see this African wood every now and again, usually on mid-century style pieces. It's beautiful to sand down and apply a clear finish to. I've mainly seen it in quarter sawn form, which has the most beautiful ribboning. When flat sawn, it looks really similar to genuine mahogany. I would give mahogany in general, when you can see the grain, about a 2 out of 5 difficulty rating. In conclusion, beautiful people, identifying wood is not always easy, and it takes a lot of practice. One of the best ways to learn is by doing, and if you can't do it in person, go online. Type in walnut furniture and examine the photos. There are probably hundreds of wood identification YouTube videos and blogs and websites and courses, but the only way to get good at it is to literally do it. Like I said, us furniture people, we're at a little bit of a disadvantage as opposed to the woodworkers who can cut off a board and look at the end grain and be able to tell exactly what they're looking at. Looking at. We often can't see the end grain, or if we can see it, it's obscured by waxes and dirt and stain. But a lot of times too, we're dealing with veneer where there is no end grain to look at. So all you have literally to see is the grain on top and it can be hard. And there are also, all of these woods that I showed you, there's multiple varieties of most of these things. Also, something to mention here, a while back I did a video on deciphering between solid wood, wood veneer, and laminate pieces of furniture. And while the video you're watching now doesn't cover any of that, I will be redoing that video um, sometime in the future. I have a few ideas that might help better explain it and improve that video, so keep an eye out for that as well. You may have noticed in this video that I didn't really go that much into detail about end grain. <laughs> It's because we often can't see it. But if you want to learn more about that, because it is one of the best ways to distinguish one wood from another wood, there are many great videos here on YouTube. As much as I'm a to each their own kind of person, I think that no matter what we want to do with a piece of furniture that we come across, we need to take the time and effort to properly identify it. Certain woods are getting harder and harder to find, and some are even now, as you've seen, listed as vulnerable species. And while I don't literally want to tell someone, hey, don't paint that, because it's none of my business, <laughs> I also think that we have responsibility to this planet that provides us with all these beautiful trees. I still paint furniture regularly, but I don't do it to try to keep up with trends or fads. As you may have noticed, I kind of do my thing. <laughs> I try to let each piece tell me what it wants. 
in a way. Try to be selective with what you're working on. If it doesn't need refinishing, maybe try to find something that does. Or if you find a piece that you were planning on painting that is a vulnerable mahogany species, maybe try to find another piece that kind of looks similar but is made of something a little bit cheaper or more common and go to town on that one. Again, like I said, I'm not trying to tell people not to paint furniture. I do it all the time. This isn't related exactly to identification, but it is something I wanted to mention because it comes up a fair bit on these channels when someone refinishes a piece and sands off all the old finish. There's always one person, <laughs> sometimes two, that gets angry and yells that the patina has been sanded away. Patina is actually a terribly misused word in this business, and often the ones yelling the loudest are the ones that understand it the least. Patina is not damage. <laughs> it's not damage. The definition of patina is always changing, but damage, actual damage finish, was never part of that. Today, Patina is best described as authenticity. So varnish and shellac that wears to a glossy shine on the rocking chair arm, or how the stain and finish sort of gently erode on high traffic areas uniformly over time with no harshness to its boundaries. The way cherry and mahogany and pine and some other woods deepen in color and get warmer and richer over the decades. Even crazing, those little cracks that you sometimes see in pottery in China as well as on wood furniture. That would be considered patina as long as it's intact. <laughs> if it's crazing and flaking off everywhere, that's no longer a nice patina. <laughs> that's damage <laughs> and it needs to be addressed to prolong the life of the piece. True patina is impossible to replicate and that's why people get so passionate about it when someone takes an antique or a vintage piece and refinishes it because nothing beats that well-worn but well taken care of feel that many vintage pieces and antique pieces have. But when the finish of a piece is past its prime, that piece of furniture is now vulnerable to moisture damage and rot and insects and it really needs to be addressed. So I just wanted to say that. <laughs> I really hope this has been informative. This took many days to put together and countless hours and about $300 at the specialty hardware store to do. So, you know, I'm not an expert, but my goal with this video was to give beginners the basics on wood composition and what makes up a piece of lumber or timber that becomes a piece of furniture and share some of the most common woods used. As much as I would love to be able to help everybody, I, there's just not enough hours in the day and that really sucks <laughs> because I want to help. That's why I do these videos even though they take so long in comparison to flipping videos. So if I'm unable to help you on a one-on-one -on -one level, at least I can do a video and then maybe you can take something and run with it. <laughs> Thank you so much for watching. I know this has been a long one and probably kind of dry for some people, but I hope you learned something and I will see you next time.